Yeah. See, what you don't realise about Stanley is he's cleverer than he looks. You don't know how difficult it is to do this and not wave your hands about and have the mic go over here. So where's my presentation? Come on. Hurry up. I'm the warm-up act, by the way, the token fat guy. Look at the age of you guys. You're all uh, millennials with your bloody smartphones. I don't know. I started in computing uh, when we all wrote Assembler. And these days you guys go on about, oh, that means punch cards, yada, yada, yada. It does have its advantages, because if you understand Assembler, you can do things at the ground level. And those are skills that have never really left me. Um, so I got into security from writing assembler exits, writing kernel, kernels, um, stuff like that, round about 95. And at that time, only people, nobody would have dreamed of going into security for a career before that. But at the time Unix came along, the stock exchange went Unix from mainframe, there was a lot of money there. Then someone invented TCP IP as far as the commercial world was considered. And in those days, if you wanted to do a penetration test, you downloaded Satan and wrote most of your tools probably. And if you wanted to do um, a firewall, install a firewall, you uh, installed Marcus Raynham's TIS firewall toolkit. So if you weren't a techie, you didn't work in security in those days. I reckon there was probably 200, maybe 300 people in the UK who knew how to install, build and harden an internet bank. And that's where I learned my trade, building, designing and putting out all the first internet banks. And it was a bit edgy. But after a couple of years, the industry changed. And it changed far for worse. What we found is that every threat that came along was the latest and greatest threat. You know, it was going to lead to Armageddon. And every technology that came along, whether it be IDS or spam filtering or something like that, SIM, there's another one, was the latest saviour. But you didn't have to do any work. You didn't have to configure it. You didn't have to understand security. It would work like magic. And then a couple of years later, Everyone was going to conferences talking about what a wasted investment it was. Well, the fact was the technology wasn't wrong. The technology was good. It was the people that were wrong. We are, a, a word I like to use, profligate. We are an industry of profligate rogues. We don't like doing the hard work. Someone else is going to do that. And you know what? We're always surprised by phishing. We're always surprised by viruses. I have $6.2 billion revenue a year coming into my company and we're always bloody surprised that someone wants to steal it. Why is that? Because we're dumb asses. Went to a dreadful, dreadful conference. This is a lovely conference because I'm speaking. Dreadful conference. It was run by the, um, the big analysts, right? And it was three hours in the morning of policy and stuff that I've been hearing about for 20 years. And there was one guy, a data engineer, uh, did a little speech on um, how his mobile product sold, sold malware and phishing. And it used um, uh, AI. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good, that's lovely. Um, saved the day, actually. I came out, I didn't commit ritual suicide because of this one guy. It was interesting. My protege that came along with me said, what the bloody hell was that all about then? I forget that everyone hasn't got the chip on the shoulder that I have and hasn't gone off and got 87 degrees like I have. He didn't know anything about the statistical methods. He, this data engineer was talking about SVM, which is meant to be one of the most easiest machine learning techniques to grasp. So I explained to him about hyperlanes, and dividing, you know, basically how it was a binary classifier and you had to know a little bit about Euclidean geometry. Not that I had much of an education myself, but I remembered that much. And I said, do you understand it now? And he said, yeah, I, I get that. And obviously the 12 people that are grouped behind me, because I'd formed a de facto conference, got it as well. And they started talking to me. So I thought, you know what? Machine learning is our next saviour technology. And if we're not careful, we're going to kill it. 
So what is machine learning? The hypothesis of this, um, this whole presentation is that I'm going to show you that you know about it already. You've already been using it a lot, and there's really not very much new about it. Um, disagree if you like, but I hope I'll prove my point. Machine learning uses statistical techniques to give computer systems the ability to learn or progressively improve. Like any cybernetic success, a sustainable system, it has to be able to improve and make itself better. But it does that without being explicitly programmed or reprogrammed. So the key takeaways from that are statistical technique, learning from data and improvement without reprogramming. So to know that, what are the statistical techniques? Well, they divide, if you can see the letters, um, between unsupervised learning. This is where I give a system a bunch of data and say, I want you to find five groups from that, 10 groups from that. And the machine goes and chugs away and comes up and comes up and says, these are the five groups. These are the five collections of data you've got. That is an example of unsupervised learning. On the bottom, you have supervised learning. That's by far the most common. You take a bunch of data, postcodes or something, and classify it as good area, bad area. And you train your system with that, and the next bunch of data you give it doesn't have those labels on it, but it can tell you whether it's a good area or a bad area, an expensive area or a poor area. That's supervised learning. You've already labelled it, and it goes and learns how to derive that categorisation yourself. Now, it's a new world, or is it? My favourite type of um, clustering is k-means clustering, and I think we've got a great potential here to actually make... Um, use this for what it's intended to be used for in the cyber security industry. It's been used since about 1911, when the first example of clustering came out. Used by anthropologists. It's used by marketeers. You've heard of dinkies? Everyone heard of dinkies? Come on, we're going to want some audience participation out here. Who is a dinky? Who's a yuppie? You're a yuppie, I saw you, you like that. I'm trash, I've got a um, tag. Um, anyway, um, so that's what it's used for. Classic examples, um, Silicon Valley. Class example of clustering. Where should we use it? Well, we should use it where it's supposed to be used. User behavioural analytics. That's what it's designed for. That's where it works. The other example... Social network analysis. And I can tell all you millennials there with your smartphones, you think this is something to do with Facebook, don't you? Social media? No. Social network analysis is those little string diagrams you've seen on Sherlock Holmes. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, Bert knows Eric, Eric knows Bert, therefore Bert is the bad guy. You know when they draw the little lines... Come on, work with me, guys. Yeah, come on, Mark. Give the fat guy... I'm, I'm the warm-up act. If you don't give me a chance, what's the next guy going to be like? Right. So, that was supposedly, supposedly invented during the Second World War. Well, that's nonsense. I've definitely seen Sherlock Holmes use it, and that was from the 1800s. They had horses. But... You use it every day. I've never been in a fraud investigation or a counter-terrorist counter uh, investigation where they haven't used it. Commonplace. Machine learning, not new. Now we go down to the bottom. Supervised learning. Bayesian analysis. You've all used Bayesian analysis, haven't you? Where have you used Bayesian analysis? Come on, it's audience participation now. Come on, you with a smartphone. I can see you're pointing at someone. Where have you used Bayesian analysis? Tell Uncle Mark, not Uncle Mike. Yeah. 
spam filtering, spam assassin, you're all too young to remember, but mail marshal, minesweeper, spam assassin, that's what it does, and it's bloody good at it. It's actually quite sexy. Buy a little book on it, read it. You'll find it quite opium-like in its attraction. <laughs> but all this is kind of nonsense, really. Because if you use a product that uses machine learning, it probably won't use most of that. It will probably use neural networks, which again, first single perceptron algorithm but invented in 1950. That is used everywhere. Why is it used everywhere? Because it's, um, is this going to be the right button? Back by now. Voyager discovery. <laughs> Young inquiry minds need to know. Yay, hey, because it's piss easy. Um, unlike this bloody thing. Um, it's very utility. You build one neural network, you can pretty much run data through it all the time. Right? So it's got commercial consequences. You get one bunch of people that understand that algorithm and you can apply it many times. But there's another reason. And this reason is anthropomorphization. Impressed? Poor boy from South London. Anyway, um, they like making an analogy between the human brain. Anyway, over here, neurons. Pretty, firing, exciting. That's what I do to you, right? Hey, all the senses working. Here, this is a real picture of a neuron. Uh, dendrite, that's the receiver. Nucleus. That's the on-off switch. Synapse, that's the sender. What can we do with a switch? We can represent one and zero. What can you do with one and zero? You remember I'm an assembler programmer and an electronic engineer. You can make a half adder. What's a half adder? It's a CPU. So you can represent memory and you can do processing. Anyway, so here we do, we represent this with neuron nodes, right? It doesn't really look like that. No, no, no. Who's a programmer here? Who's written? Who's a grown-up? You're a grown-up. You work in IT. You told me. You're a grown-up. Come on, admit it. Oh, no. You all play with gooeys, the rest of you. Shame. Shame. Anyway, uh, I'll tuck in my trousers while I think what to say next. Anyway, um, you've got neurons here. They are just two matrices. One matrices carry a bunch of weights and the other matrices carries a bunch of intermediate results. But we give them good names. At the front here, what do we think we call the front? It's the input layer. What would you imagine the input layer does? Inputs. <laughs> He's smart. He can manage the microphone and the funny mousy thing. And at the end here, we have the output. That's where the answer comes. In the middle, you've got a bunch of intermediate results. So a neural network, hey, it works, is supervised learning, so it has the data and expected results. It has a bunch of weights, and it has an input layer, and it has an answer. And for all the using, use security people, it uses a method of applying weights via an activation function to generate an estimate of the answer. And that's called, sorry I move, forward propagation. And forward propagation is once a neural network has learned something, that's how it gets the answer. How does it learn? It uses a brute force mechanism. All you security people, exactly like Hydra breaking a password or Joe or when you're using crypto analysis, a brute force analysis, it works by trial and error. Admittedly, the activation function, that's what this squiggle means here, that makes it a little bit more intelligent. But basically what it does, forward propagation. I'm heading for one. What do I get? 9.9. .9. Actually, 9 would have been a disaster. 
Point nine. So it's actually nearly there, but not quite. So what it does is it takes that number and that number from each other and gets a loss. And then it drives that back. That changes the weight. It changes it five minutes. Bloody hell. Um, so it does that. And it does that. Changing the weights each time. And it gets to the right answer. Pretty simple, really. But for those of you with masochistic tendencies, for those of you that want to learn more, some delightful fat chap wrote a lovely book. And I'm not trying to sell it to you because it costs $12.99. I'm giving it to you for free because I care. <laughs> so if you download it either tomorrow, because today is well past my bedtime, or the day after, you can read the programming examples for all the statistical methods I met. Got three minutes. Right. This is going to be like white water rafting because I got a bit enthusiastic. So here we go. Hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to rush through this. Superintelligence is the risk for all you people out there that don't have a mortgage. I wouldn't worry about it too much. The way it works is in the year 2050, Hyperdyne Systems invent a big computer, right? And it becomes intelligent and blackens the sky. And then they send an Austrian actor back in time to kill everyone. It's called the Terminator threat. Now, lots of people that are respectable think it's a real thing. The best one, I think, is Hawkins, who speaks to me. Uh, not from beyond the grave, that's a sick joke, but no. He, um, he speaks to me because he actually says, there's no reason for doing it. If people invented Strachenbaum in 1990, they'll go and invent a destructive AI, because they can. And that's his thing. Zuckerberg, we all love him, eh? Um, he thinks that it's not something to worry about. And I think he says that I have a hard time wrapping my head about that one. Impressive and erudite, isn't it? Anyway, other cultural risks. I genuinely think that we spent 20 years learning how to protect our IT systems, learning how to put them into production. We were talking about that earlier. We replace those IT staff with data engineers and we get this. The progression of man. We've all seen this before. We start off as knuckle draggers. Some of us never get away from that. And then we end up to be hunter-gatherers. gatherers. That's me. This is you guys, probably, with your bloody mobile phones voting and saying nasty things. But that's all right. We're going to run him over with an intelligent Uber cab. Tell me I'm wrong. It's already happened. The other risk you've got to worry about is data governance. Are these people aware? And this is where we talk about what's happened in the past. Uh, something happened last week we were talking about. Loads of email addresses. Do these people have the ethics and the intelligence to manage it? Now, I'm not so much worried about collected data. Collected tangible data I'm not worried about. But we're at the sophistication now where you can take some fairly innocuous features and tell me that I'm going to have a heart attack. Well, you guys probably can tell me that as well, because I'm knackered up here. But you can tell me whether I'm going to die of cancer, tell me whether I'm going to have a heart attack, just from the inferences you can generate from salary, postcode, region, occupation. Do we trust these people that don't know subverting governments is a crime after 20 years of data protection legislation. 1995, when they first proposed it, I was young and handsome. Um, do we really trust them to look after it? I suspect not. Regulation risk. Who knows about this one? 22. Basically, you have the right not to have an automated decision made. I have got a kick-ass CV, right? It's a beautiful CV. 
but it's a little bit flamboyant, a little bit out there. So if I get headhunted by a headhunter, I know I've got minus two minutes, but you're just going to have to put up with it. If I get headhunted by a headhunter, I'll get an interview. If I submit it to a portal, I never get asked. That may be because I'm obnoxious. Don't nod your bloody head! Or is it because it doesn't understand? I've got a, I, if I could be asked, I could screw up that particular inter, uh, panel selection by demanding um, that they don't do it. Now, it's never been tested under law. But think about it. There's also some... Uh, oh, worth saying here, if it, uh, it, you have a right for it not to affect your contract and not to affect significant harm. So that means if it's a profile, uh, a marketing ad that pops up, nobody cares. You just looked at an ad. If you don't get a big job because of it, people care. Last one, technical risks. Spectre. Who, assembler programmer, pipelining, IBM 3090s, 1992. You, you make conditional branching based on the data that you've run through the processor beforehand. What's that? That's data pollution. When the Spectra bug loaded data into memory that could be reaped by a sidebar process, that is an example of data pollution that exists in a lab today. Not convinced? Here's one that doesn't exist in a lab. My favourite. Let's treat the chat... You know, it talks to Hawkins's point. Let's teach the chatbot to be a sexist Nazi. Well, well, who wouldn't? They put it online for 24 hours. The internet lovies had it abusing people and threatening to kill them. That's what data pollution means. Bottom line for you, if you run a bank and you have very prescriptive security and you share the data with people with less prescriptive security, how do you know that the lacks of controls aren't governing your AI-driven, machine-powered, learning-powered security. So what do you do? First, don't just do AI and machine learning because you can. Immutable programming logic is better when the answer is immutable. If there's a what cyber engineers and uh, cybernetics, don't stare at me like that, you're making me feel guilty. This is your time I'm using. Yeah, 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 you should look embarrassed. My wife's a teacher. Uh, um, uh, here we go. Uh, point two. Uh, the system may be intelligent, but is what it does intelligent? How many software vendors have you talked about from security that actually tell you about this wonderful product and you think, I don't want to bloody do any of that. All I just want to do is keep the bad guys out. I don't want elaborate dashboards and all this crap. Just make the hackers go away, please. Please. Um, what algorithms does it use? Well, it will almost certainly be using neural networks, but there are things called ensemble learning, where you use SVM and neural networks put together. And two is better than one. Ask them, how long does it take to learn? If you've ever deployed a SOC, and there was someone here who has, you, um, you, you deployed a SOC, you always deploy a SOC and give it a three months learning period because you can't baseline your network until you know what's happening on your network. And that's exactly the same with machine learning. You need to know what the good baseline looks like and you need to know you've got clean data. How long will it take to reach that optimal state? And lastly, what are the controls over data pollution, which we covered earlier? And the very last point, and it's the point that I keep on making to all the junior CISOs that I ever meet, the bottom line is the most important. How much money is it going to save you? If it doesn't save you any money, it doesn't make you secure, don't bloody do it, do something else. And at that point, you all look exhausted, but not as exhausted as me. Why have you got an umbrella? Um, just to differentiate myself from you. 
You are. <laughs> You feel like you're an evil Bond villain going to shoot me with it or something. Could be later. Well, as long as you only shoot me with it. At that, I'll hand over to Stanley. We'll hand over to the next speaker. Are you going to come and get this? Thank you very much. Marvellous.